David. Next up we have uh, from the New Zealand First Party. <laughs> Complete with his own wine box. Uh, somebody you probably all recognise, I'll hand you over right now for five minutes to Winston Peters. No, ten minutes we were told. All right, it's ten minutes. Remember John A. Lee? <laughs> well, thanks for the chance to speak at this summit and congratulations to those of you who put it together. Now, we're all here for a serious purpose. Without exaggeration, as you've been told, our manufacturing sector and much of our export sector is in crisis. Let's start by putting things in context with a few important numbers. As of June this year, New Zealand's net international debtness stood at 149 billion. Now don't slide by that, we owe the rest of the world 149 billion. It represents 72% of our gross domestic product. That's against the backdrop of the so-called global financial crisis which a recent US Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission found was avoidable. These were the main causes. Widespread failures in financial regulation, including the Federal Reserve's failure to stem the tide of toxic mortgages. Dramatic breakdowns in corporate governance, including too many financial firms acting recklessly and taking on too much risk or disguising the nature of risk. An explosive mix of excessive borrowing risk by households and Wall Street that put the financial system on a collision course with crisis. Key policymakers ill-prepared for the crisis, lacking a full understanding of the financial system they oversaw. Systemic breaches in accountability and ethics at all levels. All this points to a lack of ethics and greed at the top of Wall Street. Wheeler dealers, bankers, speculators and traders made billions and billions in profits and bonuses. They made money on successes and they made money betting on failures. So the global financial crisis was not caused by ordinary people, yet ordinary people are the worst affected. The money dealers are still reaping their hefty bonuses. All the same old faces are virtually back in the same old places. For New Zealand, however, the debt time bomb is ticking. How are we ever going to repay this massive 149 billion debt and rising to probably 178 billion while we are eroding our manufacturing and export capacity. What we now know is that to pay our way as a nation we must grow and make products the world wants. Yet we've always known that. In short, we must be internationally competitive. Yet our manufacturers and exporters are facing a gale force headwind from an overvalued dollar. Who here doubts that? And which serious economist disputes that? But we have a government adamant, obdurate, stubbornly resisting all attempts to reform and update the current Reserve Bank Act. It's locked in an outdated economic orthodoxy, as the two previous speakers have just said. A government fixated on inflation as public enemy number one and every other economic policy has to be subordinate to that. And unfortunately, this government is aided and abetted by people who should know better, such as, for example, Bruce Willis, President of Federated Farmers. In one breath, he acknowledges that the exchange rate is too high. And then he asserts, without any basis or evidence, that, quotes, tinkering with the monetary policy framework will get us nowhere, unquote. That is staggering, coming from the chief representative of the prime production sector of this country. Mind you, he was a former banker. Perhaps that explains things. Old habits never die. There never, there never really was an era where that sort of thinking made any economic sense to this country. Except perhaps the era when that sort of thinking and the ideology behind it unleashed the dogs of inflation on New Zealand between 1984 and 89 when the overnight loan rate went three times to beyond 1100%. That was the background to the Reserve Bank Act a long, long time ago. It is not the fact today. Inflation has been under control for a long time and can remain in check while saving our manufacturing and large parts of our export sector belatedly becomes the priority. 
Sadly, as you know, the export businesses that we see closing are not coming back. For heaven's sake, even Maggie Thatcher realised that, and she knew more about right-wing economics than these people will ever know. Because you can't just bring successful manufacturing and export businesses into existence overnight, you've got to do all you can to preserve them. Typically, such businesses take years to develop. Even for our biggest and most buoyant export sector, the dairy industry, they lost one billion because of the overvalued dollar loss impact in the last year alone. In an era of huge competitive devaluations, we live with an overvalued dollar. And yet the head of Federated Farmers thinks addressing this issue, as other sound economies have, is to describe him tinkering. You know, Nobel winning economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz points out, employment is not the preserve of reserve bank governors. That, he says, and I agree, is a political responsibility and those that shrink from that concept support the unelected running the nation. That understanding or misunderstanding is at the heart of the matter. Our government is sticking to its so-called conventional wisdom that the exchange rate is beyond its power of influence. Now that's in stark contrast to countries throughout the world that are striving to protect their export sectors in the wake of the global financial crisis and its fallout. In the context of global uncertainty and weakness, countries that depend on exports as we do, and we do more than most, are exploring every means, every opportunity, and every mechanism to stay competitive. Next Wednesday afternoon, we have a Reserve Bank Bill amendment before the House, which seeks to meet the needs of current conditions and removes a break on the economy. If supported, and we are grateful to the two parties that are here today with us, the Reserve Bank Bill will at long last be able to pursue a balanced economic policy in which price stability, while important, is no longer the overriding policy objective. It's good news, the best news for manufacturing and export sector, because it will give the Reserve Bank the flexibility it needs to promote growth, employment and our export base. Now, we acknowledge the bill is not perfect. That's why a select committee could improve it. But we want the public and all those interested in this country's destiny to have a chance to have their say. Ladies and gentlemen, if this happens, then there will be a new conference in this country, not a death sentence, but a note of caution. The government party should be here today. Don't they think that 40,000 people losing their job is important? But you see, the same sort of people who caused the global financial crisis are those running this country. And which was one of the first five companies to go belly up in the global financial crisis in the USA? Well, it was a company called Merrill Lynch. And yet the public was told he was terribly well qualified and trained to run this nation. They don't think that way anymore. So don't expect any relief from that quarter. We all know that policies based on greed and the concentration of great wealth in the hands of the chosen few never get changed without action, political action. We can talk today here with all the best will in the world, but it will only be talk. We know the problem. Every problem has a solution. Think about this. With just one more seat in Parliament, we would have stopped the asset sales. With one more seat, we would have forced an easing of the exchange rate and we would have spread the burden more fairly. We would never have let, for example, the Westpac boss get away with a tax cut of $5,000 per week. During the election campaign, we told this to everyone who would listen. And what happened? Well, about a million people stayed home on election day and didn't vote. The best action to come from today would be for everyone to get out of here and out there and convince people to vote. Convince our friends, our workmates, everyone we know that the people still have the power in this country. They have the power to change things around, but only if they vote. We don't have violent re revolutions in this country, as you know. We don't overthrow governments, but ordinary people have the power to throw out those whose callous policies make life hard for them. And every day we hear more propaganda about the market and market forces. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the unfettered market and unrestrained market forces have failed humanity. We can't rely on the people and the systems that cause the problems to fix them. They are just making things worse. The only way to fix things is by political action. We as a country have fixed things in this country before and it's always been the result of the ballot box and efforts of ordinary people. We have to work hard to prevent more damage. We have to remember that leaders are but the trusted servants of the people and we have to keep reminding the leaders about that. And they should have a memory. Well, at least that lasts for more than a month. The non-voters at the last election is an appalling figure that fits the culture of national. That cannot be overstated. The non-vote at the last election is an appalling figure that fits the political culture of national. For the last thing the National Party wants is people thinking about politics and acting on it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's face it. For a ship that leaves port with no port in mind, for that ship, no wind is the right wind. Our greatest problem, our greatest enemy, is the apathy of our own people. If we do something about that today, this summit will have been seriously worthwhile. Don't think for one moment that we can fail if we are resolute in the actions we now must take. Thank you.